Nobody, nobody can ask me about meanings. No meaning questions. Anyway, welcome to Thank you. Um, did you all move back a little? Sorry. Um, so thank you, Craig. This is my third show here. And, and thanks to Bridget for, for being so supportive, making things work. Um, I wanted to call in sick, but <laughs> nobody answered the phone. I was all, my <laughs> stomach was all wibbly wobbly. And, and uh, this is, you know, nervous making, but uh, let's just jump into it. Um, what? <laughs> Say what? Raise my voice. Pretend you are my children. Um, yeah, so let's let's just just jump into it. But the question is, what is it? We're this is it, and I'm spitballing here because I'm not prepared with any artist statement or anything. This is the way I work. Is how I what I'm doing now, and you're a part of it. It's kind of meta, isn't it? Um, you know, I I have some vague notion of what I might or might not say. Uh, perhaps pull a memory from someplace or, uh, you know, dig a pithy quote out of the back pocket of my brain. Uh, but generally, I don't know what I'm going to say or what I'm hi, doing here. Uh, so the, the way I make these things, these pictures, uh, well, there's two two things. I'm a two-headed monster. Uh, I worked many years as an illustrator doing pictures for magazines and record covers and I would be presented with a problem. Here's a story about poverty in Appalachia or here's a story about a cow on the moon or whatever. Make it interesting. Make us a picture. And that was uh, kind of delightful because uh, one, I knew I'd get paid, but this is a crapshoot. Um, and two, I had a schedule. I knew I had to do it, and I, and I like solving problems. So that was one part of my brain. I, I don't do a lot of that anymore. The younger people have uh, stepped in and to the illustration world, and that, that's great. Uh, this part of my brain, I make my own problem. I make my own problem and I have to solve it. And so I will start with, as I said before, maybe a vague notion of a picture that I might, uh, might want to make and say I'll put out a big sheet of paper on my work table and something in my great stockpile of, of old illustrations and books and magazines. I like old stuff because there's a texture to the paper. Generally, the printing is a little different than modern stuff. And I don't want anything to be recognized as being contemporary, you know. So I'll, you know, I'll cut a shape out and because I like the pattern or the color or just the shape, or I'll make my own shape out of a pattern that I like and put it next to something else that I've done that with. And something starts to gel, some kind of it's an irritant, like, like, uh, like an oyster makes a pearl. So this irritant grows and grows, hopefully, into a pearl. Sometimes it's some sludgy stuff that smells of old shoes. But, you know, 
when it's a pearl, it's a, it becomes a lovely thing and a surprise to me because I don't know what these things are generally from the get-go. They evolve and then I see something happening. You know, some story is being told. I don't always know what the story is. Um, kind of know. I don't know. So, um, you know, so they're a surprise to me and that's part of the delight of doing this. It's, it's my job. My job is to make images, to make art. I've had a lot of shitty jobs. You know, I've worked in machine shops and driven trucks and painted houses, put up sheetrock, et cetera, et cetera. And it's all great. You know, it's, it's toil and that's, that's what we do, right? We, we do, we make whether it's, uh, and we're all creative, whether, whether you're creating a garden or a, or a souffle or a collage or a song, it's what we do, you know? So I, I don't consider myself particularly special because I make these funny pictures, but I, I do consider myself very lucky. Luck has a lot to do with it. And, uh, you know, giving Craig gifts once in a while helps get a show. It's hard to get a show. I, I don't envy any young artist trying to get a show. You have to get, you have to have some luck. You have to know somebody to introduce you to somebody. Luckily, uh, a guy named Michael Kirkfeld introduced me to, to Craig and Craig at first said, I don't know. But then uh, <laughs> it's true, right? I brought in the portfolio and then you said, oh my God. Uh, <laughs> I know. I think it took five years, Craig. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Craig is great, and I really appreciate his support. So, uh, what else can I say? I I'm not all that introspective. I'm not all that, you know, I, I don't take this stuff apart and think, what does it mean? Meaning comes to me sometimes where I'm making it and I go, oh, this is because, you know, I was angry at my dad or whatever the thing is. And I am, you know, a product of the ripple effect of my parents' life, as we all are to some degree of our parents' lives. And my parents were informed by the Second World War, you know, my father... My father killed people. My father hid out in sewers. He had false identities. And my mother was uh, a forced laborer. She was taken off a train in Poland and forced. Uh, they were both guests of the Third Reich, in other words. Um, and it, and it, it hurt them. You know, my, my father was, was mercurial and taciturn and dark and moody and that comes out in me in the work as well. My mother was extremely resilient, a great sense of humor. She's very rebellious, wonderful person. And what I gained from them, besides the you know weird mood, was um, they were improvisers. War, I think, causes one to improvise. How do I get this? How do I avoid that? What, what do I do? And uh, my father was an engineer. He had a degree in uh, agricultural chemistry. But when he came here, besides having to sweep floors to begin with, it's the shitty job progression that you see through our family. Um, he became uh, uh, an engineer where he had worked on missile guidance systems and lasers and all kinds of stuff. But he improvised a lot. He improvised at home, you know, in the garage. The, made a, a bird feeder and a, he cut a door in the side of the garage wall that had a, a flap on it to make a ledge and he had a big old radio in there so he could listen to music while he drank beer in the backyard. Um, and my mother was great with color and form and uh, cloth fabric. So I, I, I got a lot from them in that regard. Improvisation, these things are improvised to a very great degree degree, you know, they're like, like jazz, like improvised jazz or poetry or any 
any art form where you just kind of jump in and, and hope for the best. And sometimes it works out. I'm, I'm very pleased with these. Uh, it, uh, I was glad that I had a character to kind of hang the show on, uh, oh boy, at the start, at the uh, beginning of the show there. This, this fella here, he's in all of these pictures, sometimes hidden and, uh, and sometimes very obvious. So, um, yeah, he's, he's every man and me and you uh, going through this weird, weird period that we're living in. Um, I mean, this is a weird period. <laughs> and it's too big to hang in my house. I'm very grateful that someone bought it. Um, it was a lot of work and it's my preferred scale is smaller and more intimate. And this was a lot of work. And I did it as sort of a challenge to myself. It's sort of the difference between, uh, I guess, like uh, uh, climbing Mount Everest or taking a walk in the park, which are the smaller pieces that I feel closer to and more comfortable with. And those are, of course, much more quickly made. They're, they're definitely more uh, improvised. A couple of years ago, I started uh, making a picture every morning on a five by seven piece of cardboard. And they were called scrappings because I would just scrap oh, the scrap on my, my floor, my desk. I would just say, well, let's make something with these pieces in mind. And most of them were their little characters. And I made one every day for months, about 150 of them. Craig showed you one of them. And they were great fun. I couldn't keep going with those. But they were all improvised. I love improvising, just making stuff out of other stuff. These, uh, some of these things are made from you know, an image that you might have seen this somewhere. But putting together these, these things that you may have seen, maybe not have seen, but you've never seen this before. And that I think, you know, art is making things that haven't been seen before and won't be seen again. I mean, there's reproductions, of course, but does this make sense? Yes. <laughs> now what, Craig? Since your uh, portrait, did you, I missed part of it, I was out. Oh, fine. Did you talk about where your name came from? Oh, and oh, oh. Your, how you sign your work. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I spoke there for a second about my father and improvisation. He had to improvise his life. He had to change his name because he was in the Polish underground and he, and he had to protect his family. So he took on a, uh, another name, another identity. Um, different birth dates, different birth cities. And I sort of did the same. My name is Andrzej Jerzy Lubicz Gregor Ledbuchowski. And the, 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 the first part of that, the Andrew or Andrzej Lubicz, I just took that last name Lubicz and became Lubicz. You get it? Lubicz. Everybody now. Lubicz. Oh, I love this. <laughs> It made those whitening strips that I used worth it, you know. Um, so yeah, so I improvise this person that I, I am, Lou Beach. And uh, it's part of the improvisation that, uh, you know, I was Andy Moon for a while when I was a hippie. That was uh, another story for another time. I'm a oh, thank you. <laughs> Because I'm not that fond of my, my handwriting. In fact, many years ago, uh, I was hired by Security Pacific Bank, or actually a, a big uh, uh, advertising company, to make some images for the bank, which later became Bank of America. They had a big building downtown Pacific. Well, they turned some of these big collages into prints that were printed by Cirrus Gallery downtown, very well known. Uh, gallery. So I had to sign a couple hundred of them. Well, after the first 
three or four, my, my hand was just going all wiggly wobbly. And uh, Jean Malant, the guy who ran the, the uh, place, just standing behind me said, you know when Robert Rauschenberg signs them, they're all exactly the same. <laughs> um, well, anyway, so instead of signing my name, I came up with, with this little gizmo here that you'll see in the corner of every picture. It's, um, uh, what are they called? Semaphore flags, right, used in boats. And one stands for an L and one stands for a B, I guess. And uh, that's my signature now. Oh, a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I work, I have, you know, uh, sweater boxes full of stuff that's just thrown in there. I have cabinets full of stuff. Uh, here's one of those pithy quotes that I was mentioning. Um, Carl Jung once said that uh, in chaos there is cosmos, and that applies to how I work. I have no organization, none. I have a very good friend who's a wonderful collage artist in Chicago, Tony Fitzpatrick, and he has things organized, little drawers, you know, horses, legs, uh, red dots, and all that. I, it's too much for me. I, I like the chaos because it allows me to find my way through the chaos. And uh, Carl Jung also said, um, what did he say? In disorder, there is a secret order. And I kind of hold on to those things. Um, so, no, I, I, I don't know. Part of the pleasure for me is, you know, finding how the picture evolves, what, what, what it becomes, and what it says to me. And that doesn't always work, of course. I have drawers full of crap. That I, but I manage to cut it up and, and reuse it and hopefully make it better. So I'm a recycler. I do it for the children. <laughs> you, uh, you're talking about improvisation. I'm very sorry? You're talking about improvisation. Improvisation. Oh, yeah, yeah. But uh, I'm curious if it starts that way and then narratives of some kind are important to you. I, I'm not saying that maybe there's a narrative you want to tell us, but it seems like if there must be some narratives that happen for you, Oh, ab oh, absolutely. These are all narratives. I like to write as well. And uh, so, yeah, no, they, there's a narrative to each one of them. And I... Are they private or do you like to share them? <laughs> um, um, well, I, you know, I don't always, I don't always know what the narrative is. I mean, I'll look at it and I go, what the hell is this about? It is called... Uh, Madonna of the desert. So there is this figure that I take as a Madonna figure, and there's our guy, oh boy, who is, you know, part mouse, part cactus, and uh, she's holding a, uh, a horseshoe for luck, or she's playing horseshoes. I don't know. You, you can bring your story to it. I don't always know. I just know that, there, that there's stories in each one of them. But you get what I'm saying. There's such a density that it seems like the narrative must be something that you're attached to. Well, but I don't always recognize it. You know, I, I, I actualize some of them. Yeah, I go, I, I think, because in the discovery process, I go, oh, so this is about, you know, when I stop going to church or whatever it is. I don't know. But uh, don't ask that again. Um, <laughs> it's a good question. I, I'm just kidding. You. Oh, I'm, she, she was first. <laughs> Um, you know, I just found your initial design. I want to tell you, you are very, oh, I'm yeah, my friend. Is my friend. It's okay. So I want to tell you how you like your writing. Um, oh, thank you. They're, they're quite distinct. You know, I read one in particular that said, look for me at the reception, um, and I won't remember your name, so oh. you can call that, but look for the guy that looks like me. <laughs> and I thought it was very touching. Well, so, thank you. And I think that it also kind of very much is a thread to your works. It's very, very connected. Your works are also a conversation. And I think I really appreciate that. So oh. I just wanted to let you know.
Yeah. Well, thank you. Well, you're part of the conversation. You bring what you interpret the narrative to be. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Pete. <laughs> Sorry, Louie, on your best. No, I, you, have you relied all your career on collage, or did it was uh, coming to the use of collage a gradual, uh, gradual development? I relied all my career on the kindness of strangers. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, well, I, you know, like any kid, I guess I, you know, I drew things and had crayons and coloring books and cut things. Oh, I know. Family Apocrypha has me. Well, let's move back a step. When my parents, when the war was over, my parents uh, met up again in Germany. My father, who had been uh, a prisoner of war, and my mother uh, was in a forced labor camp. Uh, the Polish government in exile, which was uh, located in London, sponsored him to go to university in Germany. So I was born in Göttingen, in Germany, the, where the famous Max Planck Institute is. Planck. And um, so family lore is that uh, I was put in a, in a crib or a playpen and given magazines and newspapers, which I cut up to <laughs> Keep, not cut up. That came when I was two or three when I had a blade. Um, <laughs> they, you know, I, I tore things and that, for whatever, kept me busy or out of their hair or, re I don't know, but that's the family lore, right? This My, my sister surprised me, it flew in from, uh, from Tucson, there was a tap on my shoulder and I turned around and there was my little sister. We went through all of this turmoil together as young people. <laughs> so, what was the question? Have you always used collage? Oh, thank you, Peter. <laughs> oh, well, it's, no, you know, I drew and painted some, but I was never really, I didn't have the, dis I never went to art school, so I, I never, and I didn't have the self-motivation to learn how to paint well or draw well. I, you know, I still, I, you know, I still doodle a lot. Um, so collaging came probably more in the 60s when I was uh, exploring surrealism, going to shows and galleries and reading up and felt some affinity for, for that form of art. And uh, I thought, well, let's try this. I, I actually started making uh, assemblage before I made paper style. I worked in a machine shop that made drawer pulls. So there were a lot of empty wooden boxes there, drawers, and I would take them home and fill them with stuff. I felt, uh, you know, an affinity to the San Francisco uh, assemblage movement and there's a lot of it here too, I guess. You would know better than I about the history of art. I'm, I'm kind of a dummy as far as history goes. Uh, so yeah, about this, in the, in the late 60s, I started making collages. I made hippie collages, you know, girls made out of butterflies and, and rocket, you know, kind of early experimentation with, with figuring out what it was about and, you know, marijuana. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Don't forget about the pyramid era. Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, my, my girlfriend at the time, <laughs> we made uh, these, I, 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 I made a, a form that when put together formed a four-sided pyramid, right? So I would glue three sides together and so it made a void, which she and I would go to the beach and get sand, and we'd fill the thing with sand, pack it down, glue it back up. So we had this nice weighty pyramid and then cut up uh, pictures from Life magazine, glue them to this thing, and then put a, a self uh, adhesive uh, sheet of acrylic or whatever, acetate on it. And we try to sell it to you know hippie stores on Santa Monica Boulevard and Sunset. Uh, so that was the pyramid phase. Uh, pyramid power. Did they sell? The pyramid power. 
pyramid power thing. You'll forgive me, but the, the acoustics here don't relate well to my hearing aid, so. This is my, my dear great friend, Hudson Marquez, the creator of the Cadillac Ranch. And, um, Thank you. Thank you. It's 50 years old. That's enough. <laughs> so anyway, I, I don't know what else I can tell you. I'm, I'm, I'm open to answering any uh, easy questions. Mara? What uh, There's a lot of sweat involved. Um, I, you know, whatever. I, I have a bunch of different ones. I even use a glue stick occasionally. I'm not fond of it. Um, any of the golden Liquitex mediums. I, I like uh, Itoya O-Glue, which is a clear liquidy thing. The nuts and bolt question, I like those. <laughs> <laughs> what? What did he say? You can't hear that. Oh, <laughs> I'll take it as a compliment. Oh. What in general is what are your dreams about? And specifically in this art, what's with the cello? It's got like cello eyes. Well, that's uh, that, that's an art reference. What's the question? What is the what, what, what is this cello thing in the middle? It's an art reference to a, a famous piece by that is a Man Ray. Man Ray. So if you if you yeah you'll see it. <laughs> you had another question. Oh my dreams. Lately they've been pretty intense. Lately you know there's I had wolves in a dream. Otherwise they're kind of pedestrian. You know lately I've been because I'm so anxious about the show and anxious about this talk, so they were, they were really all over the place. But now I'm totally comfortable with all of you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hi. You, I, I'm so sorry, you really have to... Speak. Uh, both, both. There's times when I will put like something on you know, replay, you know, be Muddy Waters or Alice Coltrane, some of the, the same thing over and over again. So I'm not too worried about having to change it. And I'm perfectly fine with silence. So it just depends on my, my mood. Do you work on several pieces at once or is it like you sit down and do one? There's, there's usually one in the hopper that maybe I'm, but again, because the way I work is so improvisational, unless I see something, I'll put that aside for now while I finish this thing. So usually it's one at a time. And also, when you're talking about the little pieces that yeah. you made, what made you stop making them? Because you're doing that every day. It's, I think, you know, it ran its course. I, I made a series of, of birds. Um, it just ran its natural course. I just didn't want to repeat myself. Um, yeah, I, I like doing a series. I did a bunch of putting photographs together some months ago called splits, where there's one photograph on top of another, and I come up with some smart aleck phrase for it. And, but I'm, you know, I'm kind of done with those too. Do you lay it all out without the adhesive first, and then, like, or do you build it up? Well, this one, uh, all of the striped stuff in the back, I just said, I'm just going to do that and see what happens afterwards on this big piece of black uh, foam core. I'll just see what will happen. And what happened was the rest of it, which was generally not glued down right away, move things around. Sometimes I, I work quickly in, in the improvisational mode and I just slap it down and move on, you know. This one was a lot of work, like I said. Did you put that horizon line down first? Yeah. Uh, kind of, yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, when I, these horizontals and these verticals and these horizontals, I did it and I go, God, what am I going to do with this? I don't even like it. <laughs> How long did it take you to do this giant? A few months. But I'm lazy. 
I don't have much discipline and I'd rather go in the do yard work, you know. I mean, this is my job and I, I love my job. It's the best job I've had. But there's times when I go in there and I go, I can't do this. I'm going to go, you know, have lunch with Hudson and hope that he pays this time. Um, <laughs> it's a joke. Um, what? The question? Any more books? Yeah. Coming up. Books. Oh, your first book, The Soul Wonder. Oh, my book. That's kind of old news. I made a, I had a book. Oh, a new book. Well, that would be nice of the scrapbooks. Scrapbooks, stories. Stories, yeah. I keep stories. getting urged to make another book. Had a book come out in 2011, and they were, they were just made up of, of uh, Facebook posts, which at the time were limited to 420 characters. So the book is called 420 Characters, and I was lucky enough to get a publisher and I made a lovely little book. It's a great book. Thank you, Ed. Ed Valfrey, photographer and great friend. <laughs> you have uh, chairs in a couple of the pieces. I do. This chair repeats in that one. Yeah. Does that represent anything to you? Um, yeah, well, chairs kind of represent uh, a, a person, a human. These don't have arms, but chairs have backs and feet and legs and arms. And I've used them as stand-ins for, you know, a person. So, yeah, I, I like chair. This one was fun because I had the same, you know, the same reference material for this one and that yeah. one that are kind of twins. It's interesting because Carlos Omar has also used chairs floating in the sky in these pastel paintings. Yeah. For him, it was a reference to time. Yeah. Sitting in a chair at school, looking out the window, wishing Jesus. Yeah, chairs are imbued with us. I mean, and they have seats like we do. And uh, yeah, they're they have they have us, our DNA on. I watch a lot of crime shows, so I know that. <laughs> What's your favorite album covers that you designed? <laughs> going way back. Oh, going way back. I suppose the weather report, heavy weather one was, it uh, it got a lot of recognition, got a Grammy nomination. But I, my favorite one is the very first one I did. There's no type on it. I got fifty dollars for it. Rounder Records. It was for Ewan McCall and Peggy Seeger, who were British folk people. It was a scene of a devastated city in black and white, obviously Europe, because it had a little smashed out Volkswagen in it, and a dark cloudy sky. And in the sky were two red roses. So it was graphically pretty strong. And it was my very first one. So, and it somehow said something to me about my parents. So that's probably my favorite cover. Were you influenced by the Polish, by the Polish poster movement? No, but I mean, I appreciated it, but I, I, that was a, kind of in retrospect. Once I already was doing stuff, I looked, I go, oh my God, this is so, I feel akin to it, you know. And also Vichinanki, which are cutouts that are, you see them in China and Mexico, cut out things <laughs> that are, that make pictures, not, not in this form, but more lacy like. Speaking of that, your cuttings are so precise. Kind of tools do you use? Oh, I use scissors and exacto blades, number <laughs> 11. So I like to tear as well, you know, 